Here the team we could see Professor Sonhi was in search of new frontiers of knowledge in an expanding horizon. It's interesting to observe that large number of academics are still engaged in this discussing the same issues in India and elsewhere. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have said what I wanted to say at this stage. Thank you for your patience. May I now request Ambassador Chatural to preside over the proceedings of this function. As you know, Ambassador Chatural is one of our most illustrious diplomats belonging to the prestigious Indian Foreign Service. With his varied experience, he has been a great source of strength to the Professor Emil Sondi Trust and the Emil Sondi Institute for Asia Pacific Affairs since their inception. To briefly mention some of the highlights of his fruitful career, he has set up the Indian Embassy in Havana, being the first Indian resident representative in that country, was one of the few non-Arab representatives in Havana during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. He was High Commissioner in Canada, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and Ambassador in Kuwait. He also taught in JNU for one year and served the UPSC as its chairman for five years. Ambassador Chatwa. studies here and abroad in Germany fought his first Lok Sabha election from Nanital in the year 1962. This was followed by three consecutive successful elections from the same constituency till 1977. After 1977, Shri Pant had a stint in the Rajya Sabha and was the leader of the House in 1979. As well as the responsibilities and the positions that he held in Delhi, there is hardly any ministry that he did not have, be it defense, home, finance, uh, atomic energy, heavy industry. (laughs) 
thank you, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and he, his last post was as the prestigious post of deputy chairman of the planning commission. This sums up what is published in the biodata. Now something which is not published in the biodata. And I have had the privilege of receiving Shri K. C. Pant when I posted abroad in two of my hostels. First in South Korea and then in Canada. I want to share with you that I have found him as a compassionate person, compassionate and a just person with a lot of goodness of the heart. May that goodness, the inner strength that you have, Chiri Pant, never leave you. Now, a few words about our guest speaker who is going to get the prize for 2011. And for our convenience, this Hill Biodata has been very briefly summed up by chairperson of our trust, Mr. Sonji. And I'll be brief so that we leave enough time for the address and for the remarks of our chief guest and of course for Mrs. Sondi also. Air Commodore Jasjit Singh, AVSM, V. Chakra, VM, retired, leading strategic, uh, strategic and defense expert, fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force, was graduated thrice for distinguished service and gallantry and awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2007. Currently, founder director of Center for Air Power uh, Studies. Uh, studies. He, uh, he was formed the director of the Institute of Defense and Strategic, Strategic Affairs, IDSA, and founded the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Convener of the task force that set up the National Security Council in 1998. He served two terms as member of the National Security Advising Board, was member of the International Commission for New Asia and for Peace and Food. Uh, he was consultant to the Parliament Standing Committee on Defense and advisor to the 11th Finance Commission. He is a project writer whose books include Air Power in Modern Warfare 8, 85, in 85. <coughs> this was published. Non-provocative uh, non Defense, Nuclear India, Indian Defense uh, Spending, Air Power and Giant Operations, Iraq War 2004, <coughs> Defense for, uh, from Skies, Indian Air Force, uh, Indian Air Force through 75 years, and the Icon, uh, uh, contributing, uh, Icon, contributing a detail to nearly three dozen books. He writes on strategic and security issues, uh, in academic journals and newspapers. This is the summing up of the uh, biodata as published. Now, again, sharing something which is not published, I have found uh, Sri Kaer Kamaru Jajir Singh, despite his learning, despite his uh, standing in the academic world, a very humble person and his humility has never left him with the room so ever he has been dealing. Thank you very much. And may I request the chairman, chairperson of the trust uh, 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 to, uh, to read the uh, citation for the prize winner of 2011. 
e a Tamaro di Agizia. Ecco. On behalf of the Amazon Trust and Institute for Asia Pacific Affairs, I add my voice, I add my voice to those of the previous speakers in welcoming all of you to this function to mark the conferral of the fifth Nobel Prize for International Politics on Air Commodore Jasjit Singh, currently director CAPS as the Center for Air Power Studies is popularly known. And the committee that made the selection from among several nominations comprised, apart from Trustee Sri Chatwal and myself, uh, MJ Akbar, an eminent journalist and member advisory panel of the ML Sodhi Institute, Sri Ajay Sani, Director of the Institute for Conflict Management, who was an earlier winner of the prize, Dr. Pushpesh Pant, Professor Emeritus, International Studies from GNU, who, apart from his academic expertise, is also a renowned culinary expert. Uh, so I welcome everybody who has come here this evening. I'm particularly happy that the two chief actors today, uh, Shri Kesi Pant and Air Governor Jasjit Singh, are old colleagues. They go back at least to April 98 when the NDA government appointed a three-man task force to examine the setting up of the National Security Council. This was headed by Shri Kesi Pant and the member secretary was Air Commodore Jasjit Singh. So it must have been quite a memorable collaboration. Today, it is my pleasant duty to talk about uh, Air Commodore Jasjit Singh's life and work. Uh, there may be a little repetition, but I hope you will bear with me. Now, this is by no means an easy task to talk about him, because a more self-effacing, modest achiever is hard to find in India. He doesn't advertise himself in websites, and getting him to yield information about himself is like squeezing blood out of a stone. However, despite his best efforts to keep his light under a bushel, his reputation has spread abroad, and in 2006, uh, he, uh, President Abdul Kalam was pleased to confer on him the Padma Bhushan for outstanding service to the nation in the field of defense and strategic affairs. Very graciously, he has now accepted the Emmons only prize. Uh, six are known, are renowned for their courage and fearlessness. But uh, Air Commodore Justin Singh in particular comes from a highly decorated family. True to that tradition, we find that as a young man, as a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force, where he started out from his career, he was decorated thrice for distinguished service of an exceptional order and gallantry on the battlefield. In the 1971 war, both he and his elder brother won the Veer Chakra. So, inc so incidentally, it is his nephew, anyway. He himself rose to become Director of Operations of the Indian Air Force. However, Justin Singh was obviously not only muscle and brawn and daring do, he was all those things, but when the government decided to set up a security think tank, ITSA, or the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, he was reputed to that institute from the Air Force and succeeded Kesu Bramanyam as director in 1987, remaining in that post till 2001. From that time on, first at IPSA and then with the establishment of the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Center for Air Power Studies, Jaskit Singh has demonstrated a distinct flair for institution building. One can confidently say that he fully embodies the values advertised by ITSA, and I quote, integrity, honesty, commitment, professionalism, pursuit of excellence, teamwork, innovation, and creativity. Whereas ITSA's scope covers national and international security, the Center for Air Power Studies, which he himself founded in 2001, has, as its name suggests, a more specialized focus on multi-dimensional trends in warfare, and within that, a special focus on air and space power, and that again concerned with doctrines, strategies, and its deployment for civil and military purposes. It also covers non traditional security issues of environment and energy security, including nuclear energy and military history. 
Couch has a long list of publications on these issues and brings out two reputed journals, Air Power and Defense and Diplomacy. They also have a newsletter on nuclear security. Now, driven by his perceived concern that India is not building enough intellectual capacity to sustain her rising power, Air Commodore Jasjit Singh has made it his institute's policy to encourage young scholars, including women, to become tomorrow's security experts. The relationship is often reciprocal, as he retains an openness to receiving new ideas from young innovative scholars. In fact, CAPS has a good sprinkling of uh, professionals from both civil and military backgrounds, and this ensures interdisciplinary research and collaboration. Also, apart from nurturing institutions, Jasjit Singh has always found time for his own academic pursuits, and his output, whether in books, articles, in learning journals, or the press, is formidable. It demonstrates a versatility in approach to security issues, be it aerospace power, nuclear doctrine, neighborhood challenges, defense organization, or economics. He's played with concepts of competitive and collective security, and in one of his latest studies, titled Revolution in Human Affairs, The Root of Societal Violence, he writes, and I quote, the greatest global challenge that faces the international community today is that of the current transnational revolution in human affairs, which in turn is triggered by the combination of three revolutions, a revolution of rising expectations, the information and communications revolution, and a broader industrial technological revolution. Unquote. Obviously, he's a man who has both an eye for detail and the capacity to paint in broad strokes. Um, I, I think I have to repeat uh, what some has been, something that has been said before, whether this is meant to be a citation. So um, I will not recount all his publications, but let me just say he's been a contributing editor of nearly three dozen books, apart from the number he's authored himself. And his latest book is interestingly on India-Russia relations. We also note that apart from the NSC task force, he's been a member of the International Commission for New Asia and for Peace and Food and consultant to the Standing Committee on Defense in the Indian Parliament and advisor to the 11th Finance Commission of India. It is with such a range of achievements, interests and expertise that he most deservedly received the Evan Sondi Prize for International Politics for 2000, 2011. I cannot end without adding a postscript which links the air corridor with the late Professor Evan Sondi. Inevitably, as members of Delhi's defense and foreign policy circles, they had to meet, both being passionately concerned about the same things, Indian national security, of course, and linked with it, foreign and economic policy. In fact, I remember sitting in on several breakfast sessions with them in the India International Center, where they had passionate conversations about their favorite subjects. They shared several other attributes. Air Commodore, of course, himself was a Sikh, and then Sodhi was a fervent admirer of Sikhism. The professor had taken his master's degree from the Lyapur Khalsa College in Jalandhar, where he was one of only two non-Sikh students in the college. And he quite enjoyed finding his name typed on various lists as one of the last seen. He worked and played, and especially hockey with the Sikhs, studied under their professors, never forgot his literature classes with Kurbachin Singh Thalib. He even took a course in Sikh religion and stood first, and he retained an interest in Sikhism for the rest of his life. Now, Air Commodore Dastit Singh has been described as using national interest as the only prism through which to analyze every development in the South Asian region and beyond. He's also referred to as a man ever ready to engage in discussions on security issues confronting India with all kinds of people, whether in uniform or civvies, whether from the intelligentsia or the general public, professional academics or students. All of this could equally well be said of Emmanuel Sundi, whose focus might have been more on foreign policy, but who would engage in discussing issues of the day, whether with the man on the street, because he was a politician after all, or his grandmother, his academic and political colleagues, and the erstwhile colleagues in the Ministry of External Affairs, and not to mention his students. After the program tests in May 1998, Air Commodore Justin Singh traveled to many world capitals to explain India's threat perception and her need for nuclear deterrence. 
And at the same time, and with exactly the same objectives, Professor Soli made a tour of American think tanks. Justice Singh has always emphasized the fundamental importance of security, but could hardly be described as a whole. Similarly with Professor Soli, his strong stance for defense preparedness and neutralization went hand in hand with his sustained study, practice, and advocacy of peace and conflict management. Thus, it is very much in the fitness of things that the Prize for International Politics 2011 should link the name of Professor M.F. Sony with that of Air Commodore Justin Singh. Thank you. Uh, now we will have a small presentation ceremony uh, to make to uh, Commissioner Jajit Singh. Presentation of Ishwar to him by Ambassador Chatwal.
the Trust and Institute. To confer this praise on Jagjit Singh Ji. And I congratulate him. Sri Chaitanya referred to the fact, or in Madhuri is said, that I have worked closely with him since 98 or in 98. The fact is, I have known him for decades. I was associated with the establishment of the IDSA. Shivaji Chavan was the president and the vice president of the committee. And over the years, I have kept in touch. I have seen the institution grow. I have seen what a valuable service it has done to the area of uh, defense studies and security analysis. I have seen it as well. It is the case of Ramanya. In the initial years, who gave it shape and direction. And then, of course, I saw it grow in the chastit. It was meant to be an autonomous think tank, which, after due study and analysis, whatever independent opinions on different aspects of security and defense. We certainly needed this. And we, in my view, still need many such institutions <coughs> dealing with research and analysis of an area which is changing every day, in which new technologies are coming in. So over the years, the IDSA grew at the end into an organization which functioned in an independent manner, funded by the government, but giving independent opinions not necessarily fully in line with the government's thinking. And thereby, the Institute had considerable influence on policy makers. And what is more, it created a place for itself in the international security community among the various institutes, various people working in this area. And I can tell you some of the finest minds in the world are working precisely in the area of defense and security. I'll see this magazine sometime. And while well, I should be the last person to say so, I find it is giving too much space to ministerial speeches. And I think that is at the cost of the independence, which is its main asset, its main attribute, and for which people in the government and outside look to it. About Professor Sandi, Again, I have known him for a very long time. I knew him in parliament, I knew him outside. Of course, he was a, a scholar of the field. And you have heard about him. I will not repeat that. 
but from my point of view, what is important for us? If he is a man of very firm convictions, who spoke his mind, always freely, frankly, And I also know that in the area of politics it is sometimes found in at odds with those who have no tolerance for independent thinking. But this was his strength. He had deep knowledge of uh, security matters. And he had an abiding interest in that. In fact, how I came to know him in the beginning was that both he and I independently and publicly supported the acquisition of nuclear weapons by India. At a time when it was not fashionable to do so. And I found that the same streak of independence made whatever he said worth listening to. I am so glad that Madhuri ji is doing so much to keep his memory alive. And he certainly is a person who should be remembered by the nation. Now, the reason these studies are important and the reason these opinions are important is that we live in a dangerous neighborhood. And if you look at our extended neighborhood, that also has an impact on our security. Now, today we take Afghanistan. In, 19, in, in 2014, I think, the USA wants to withdraw its troops from there. But as the election was reporting in the United States, the trend is increasing that the troops should be called back earlier. But regardless of that fact, we have to position ourselves in such a way that in the argument analysis, we are able to build up a strong strategic partnership with Afghanistan. The long term interests are involved there. You go further west to the Arab world and you see a, a kaleidoscope which is constantly changing its patterns. Now we have very close relations with these countries. But just now the whole thing is fluid. So once again we have to see that we are not caught on the wrong foot and when, when matters get settled in that, in that region. There is, for instance, Israel and Iran and the animosity between them and the interests of larger world powers in that region. But we have a positive relationship with Iran as well as Israel. Energy supplies are involved in one case and critical arms supplies are involved in the other. How do we balance this? How do we ensure that our interests are protected in a fast developing situation which is today the concern of the whole world? Then we have Africa 
with which we have had very close political relations since the pre-colonial days. And very close relations even today. But China has entered Africa for economic ties and to take full advantage of its natural resources. We are delayed in that, we are, we are falling behind. The natural resources today is a scramble for natural resources, for raw material supplies. They are depleting and the demand is not shrinking. And in this era of globalization, all countries are for cornering essential raw material supplies. Developed countries have a lot of experience, centuries of experience in this. Developing countries are now also in this race. And in this lies the scene of future conflicts. Not only the large industrial raw materials and so on, but essentials like water and energy, which everybody needs, can become sources of conflict or Therefore, we need to think fully, we need peace and stability in this region so that we can develop. And our policy is always being non aggressive non-expansionist. And yet we have been subjected to four wars. But what is the lesson there? You may have very good intentions, but it must be backed by military muscle. Mm -hmm. And if you confuse intent with military strength, then you may get into trouble. Now we have to be very, very careful in watching very closely the balance of power in this region. This is we speak about it later. And we should not be guided only by uh, intentions and by the need to engage all our neighbors. Take India and China. Take the budgets this year. India's budget is hovers around 2% for GDP. We have been trying to inch towards inch, towards 3%, so we have to stay at 2%. China's budget is 2.5 times ours. So we have to, we have to see these things. And we have to see to what extent this imbalance <coughs> is, from our point of view, tolerable. So I really don't want to take more of your time because this is a subject on which one can go on speaking for a very long time. But I would like to mention one point, and that is the new technologies that I referred to earlier, which are likely to change the nature of war. Amongst them, a key element is going to be electronic warfare in wartime and in peacetime. So we might consider even going for establishment of a full-fledged, specialized military, electronic or cyber command, separate command or something like that, because this is going to be an extremely important area. I think that I'd be failing my duty if I did not mention my distress. At the public display of trust deficit 
and discordance between the defense ministry, or defense minister, and the chief of army staff. The army is a highly disciplined force which operates on the basis of looking up to the next higher level and accepting its authority. And as you go, they look up to people on top. So I feel very concerned, not by the current happenings which may be forgotten or which, which may pass, but the damage this could do to the morale of the armed forces. The armed forces are a hierarchical order. And therefore, we all of us have to be very careful to see that we don't affect this morale on which is security and the defense of the country depends. So with these words, I would like to thank you for the patience with which you have heard me. And once again, I would like to congratulate Jesse. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Panji, for your very incisive, thoughtful, and comprehensive remarks. May I now request the Kamal of Jajit Singh to address us. Mr. Chatwal, Ms. Madhuri Sabdi, Mr. Chandra, Marshal of the Air Force, former Chiefs of Air Staff, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I've stood here the very often and spoken, but not as numerously as I will do it now. I am a little shaken by the views of people who otherwise I respect so much in their faith. If I have gotten into anywhere, it has been on the guidance of many people. The Marshal of the Air Force himself, Archie Marshal, my good friend Archie Marshal, the Honorable Sheikh Kesipant himself. If, it might, if you'll permit me, sir, to just mention just one instance. In those days when India was under enormous pressure from the United States, we had a very large conference, very high level people from the US government. Difficult ones to deal with, people like Joseph Mai, if you recall, sir. At lunch, Mark Joseph kept on pressing hard to Shikanji that why don't you give up missiles. So finally, he kept giving his very gentle arguments. And Mr. Joseph Nye was insisting that don't build your knee in the long range. So at a suitable point, Mr. Hunt actually <coughs> told him that you have no then Professor Nye, you have no difficulty if we continue building the Prithvi. So he said, I give up. I worked a bit under him more than once when he was the Defense Minister of India, when he headed the Task Force on National Security Council. I tried to work hard all along. I don't want to take any more time. I picked a topic which Madhuri allowed me to pick, which is I, I thought was difficult. With this audience, it actually is even more difficult. 
because the first question that comes to mind is this. That India, in my opinion, is rising the global power equations. But do the Indians know about it? Do we understand its implications? Above all, are we prepared for it? This new role. I'm not going to give any answers to this. I'm just going to leave this question in your mind. There are many other things that one will talk about, and I'll move on to that. Very quickly, looking back at some part of history, everybody said when I moved from the Air Force to the, in the Institute of Defense Studies and analysis, in fact, with which Mr. Kissipunt was a founder member way back in 1965. And I said it all along. People said it's a bipolar world, and I kept wondering that if I were to put that on a screen, will it actually look like bipolar? Two of the largest countries of the world, no doubt poor, say it all of it. China on one side, India on the other, besides the other 140 countries of the developing world. And that is so, and bipolarity was actually Euro Atlantic bipolarity. The bipolarity of the dual countries. Then, what is it just after that? When the Cold War ended, then you suddenly realized the reality that there was old centers of power and the new centers of power. And, it, and the power did not, not necessarily belong to just the biggest or the largest guns and weapons. North Korea today can threaten a big country. And so it can go on. <clears throat> if you look back into history, you find some amazing facts. Long, long ago, but even as late as 1800, 1750, you find that the most prosperous countries were China and India. So it is not that global power is moving from west to east because of the rise of China and India. It is the reemergence of China and India that at one time was the most powerful country. Fortunately, both sides respected the Himalayas between them, which itself is something that we need to think about. Very quickly, this global power shift, in my humble judgment, is what is leading to not just a polycentric world, but a polarizing world. This polarization is going to be different from the polarization we saw in the last Cold War, which is essentially on an ideological basis, which was used and then on military confrontation with about 67,000 nuclear warheads deployed and threatening each other. <clears throat> Many other things come up in this and I don't want to go into the specific details. But to answer those who might question the reason they are rising, and this graph has been with me for the last about 10 years. The author of this graph was an eminent, is an eminent economist of India, Mr. Arvind Virmani. Actually, from the time he made this in 2004, that green line will get to the level of the United States at least about six years earlier, not later, because economic growth has been faster. The West European nations, which otherwise rule the world most of the time, is on the way down. Not just now, with your own debt, but earlier, progressively, over a period of time. China is the one that's going to go up. So in a way, what you're seeing here is the making of the future polarization. The United States, China, and India. Barring the initial hiccups of a country that had been de deindustrialized for the previous 300 years, an agrarian agricultural society which could not feed itself, and Mr. Kispan said he would remember 
that the, those days in the late 50s and early 60s there was a term called living a shift to mouth existence. We solved the problems. We know that we are not going to go through the sky in future. It's going to start settling down at a certain level. The Rand Corporation has just done a study on India China in 2025. At any level, either the minimum rate of growth or the maximum rate of growth or the medium rate of growth, the difference in 2025 according to Rand Corporation, which consulted a vast amount of business community, economic community and institutions will be 0.1 percent. That will be the difference between the two. Here that is what I would consider to be the shape of the polarizing world. United States might be polar within itself with its own allies, but at the head of it. China with some of its surveys, at least two are very visible both on these borders, both given nuclear weapons capability by China to be able to pose a challenge to the world around them. Russia is shrinking, not just because of collapse of the Soviet Union. All estimates are this population will go down by about 31 million people in the next 20 years. It has difficulties. Not, on, not so much on the economic front, but the demographic. And therefore, I noted down five points on the question of China's rise to power. <coughs> These are actually influence of emerging powers in developing countries. Emerging powers, can't we know? Worried about the neighbors. Second, prospects of world multipolarization are becoming clearer. Still hoping to it will be multipolar in the world. In third, international strategic competition centering on international order, comprehensive national strength, and geopolitics has intensified. This is not the dividend of peace that people were talking of in the early 90s. And therefore, China seeks to pursue an independent foreign policy of peace and national defense policy that is defensive in nature. We sincerely hope so and wish them well. But at the same time, they want to say that they will win local border war through command of the sea, command of the air, and strategic forces. I mean, what this term command? The last time this term was used was in 1922-1923 by General Dubai, General Mitchell from the United States. Even the United States, the most powerful state, the country in the world, with most powerful air forces that they possess or aerospace capabilities, even they don't talk in terms of command of the air. The Chinese are formally putting into their white paper. So therefore, going back to this time of history, how the share of India and China started dropping, in two different sets of reasons, which I need not go on here, but the fact that as India and in a way as the PRC got established, the both started to rise. China made enormous amount of mistakes and blunders like Cultural Revolution. The lowest estimate is that 40, 40 million people died in the so-called revolution, which was internal. The others is talk about 80 million or so. India will continue to pursue, pursue a more non-violent approach, more slow in growth, but at lesser cost to the human beings. Given this, ladies and gentlemen, what should be India's strategic priority for the next coming 10, 20, 30, 40 years? I remember when Mr. Casey Pons was the chair, vice chairman of the Planning Commission, he had set up a committee to define the Division 2020 committee, as it was called, to say what it would be. And he himself sat down and made out his idea of what the division should be. It's all there, published and available. So this is not something that is not known to people who are interested in the country in the future. I think that 
item number one that must be, perhaps even be called the grand strategy of India, should be comprehensive national development. It's slightly different from what the Chinese have adopted in terms of comprehensive national power. As a comprehensive national power is built upon military capabilities in comparison with other countries. India's needs are a comprehensive national development, both social economic in nature, social justice on one side, and equitable growth on the other side. Without that, the next item is not possible, peace. To, to ensure that peace, India's priority then will be to how to define our defense goals. In my view, it has been so, although there may not be a specific document, or if the document is there, it has been classified, that India will seek to prevent war through deterrence, as far as possible. But if deterrence fails, and war gets thrust on us, and the aim will be to try and finish that war as early as possible in accordance with our interest. 1965 war, the marshal was the chief of air staff. He remembers that we have discussed the, the details at length. That these, actually the aims of the war were laid down to specify that we must have Pakistan vacate Kashmir. Secondly, that we must destroy the offensive capability of Pakistan military. And third, which perhaps people might be surprised to hear, to occupy a small amount of territory which shall be returned after the war. All three were achieved, and that is not a ceasefire claim. It was not that we will continue going, keep marching westward on to Kabul and beyond. So therefore, in this emerging polarity that I keep talking about, the United Unipolar United States exists because it has a multi, multi power, multipolarity around it. China seeks a multipolar world, but in that is hidden its idea of a unipolar ratio of which China would be the, not only the Middle Kingdom but the center of it. India officially seeks a multipolar world, but I have a feeling, and I hope I'm wrong here, it is not quite clear on the dimension of multipolarity but beyond multilateralism. We need to be far more clear on this to say where do we belong between these two great powers because whatever is where you look around as well, the way I put it across, the hierarchy of power in the world already is United States, China, India, and then you can fit in the rest of the world. History tells us that a rising power or a declining power will resolve to war and armed conflict. Therefore, with two of them as Asian powers, there is a certain responsibility that rests on the shoulders of China, Chinese leadership, and that of the Indian leadership, which actually really means the intelligence here and the thinking people. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I draw up my geopolitical equation. U.S. and its allies on one side, China and its Soviet states on the other side, and India. And most of, many of you will be surprised, probably agree on my articulation on the U.S. and on China, but you may get surprised on this question of India and looking at this in 2012 on the word non-aligned. Non-alignment was adopted, as Casey Pounds will remember, by the All India Congress Committee in 1939 at a session in Haripur. The term word was not used as such, but decision of the All India Congress Committee at that time was that when we become independent, we shall not join any power block, any military thing, etc., etc., which then was adopted as India acquired self rule and, and other things. But in the process we must engage China because we have a common border on which we have our disputes. Many of them, as the Chinese would say, are left over from history. 
which I know was slightly insecure post-1989, till about 1996-97, China actually looked to India, where it's not only supplied some heavy water for a near reactor, they had also talked about joint development of a trans transport aircraft hundred seater. But the world signed two agreements, one in 1993 and the other in 1996, which now it says it's going to take a long time, which was basically on, as been, that was written down was to ensure peace and tranquility on the frontiers on the principle of mutual and equal security. If that is so, then some of the things that they're doing these days cannot be explained easily. But Unlike our earlier belief, the last line is important. That we must take an insurance against a potential possible reversal if they take place in spite of us. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Kisipanji, ladies and gentlemen, what are the defining features of India's grand strategy for the future? One, comprehensive national development. Second, cooperative peace. When I talk of corporate peace, what I mean is actually cooperating with your adversary to ensure peace. Because it's not, a corporate peace is not merely having good relations with friends, but to try and make it in such a way that you actually are able to do this. That's not an easy task to do, but at least as a name, we must keep it in mind. Third, non line Fourth, self reliance That by and large means security areas, which all this is then based on credible deterrence, nuclear, conventional, or even political. That, ladies and gentlemen, sir, and Mr. Chairman, is the way I see India rising in, right in the midst of the polarizing world. The previous Cold, Cold War and polarization was geographically away from us, and every time that Cold War moved closer to us, for example, in Afghanistan, India's security was affected adversely. What are we, how are we going to solve this amongst these two existing giants and the rising giant is, is the big question that we must debate, discuss, and come to a common understanding. I'm not asking for consensus, but a some sort of common understanding which will be valid for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Air Commander Jajit Singhji, for your very learned and thought-provoking address. Air Commander Jajit Singh has agreed to accept just two or three questions from the audience. Please, whosoever wants to ask a question, identify yourself and put, it, put the direct question and not an observation on his address or whatever has been happening. Just a question. Yes, I see a hand. Uh, could you just elaborate when you say engage with China and cooperate with USA? <coughs> I, sh I should have known very well the gentleman and will put a slightly difficult question. Engaging China and cooperating with the United States is just exactly what it is. Because China may not cooperate with you on every issue. For example, I don't think the Chinese have any incentive to solve the border dispute. And I get surprised that Indians are very keen to solve the border dispute. As if after solving the border dispute, the Chinese army will go away. There's no way, because the problem is still it. And therefore, it is. It, it cannot, it, cooperation it will operate at a much higher level than simply engaging. The United States is the sole superpower. 
we need a, a, lot of thing, a lot of things that the United States can provide. Not a security cover, not in terms of an alliance, but as an equal partner, strategic or non-strategic. That is the way I, I, I am trying to explain this. But there are many other ways that somebody else would have. But this, I think, is simply to, the choice of the terms was basic. My choice of the words was based on this sort of thing. Anybody else? Thank you very much. And uh, is there hand? I want to ask my eldest grandson, Marjan, to carry this home for me. Your shoulders are stronger than mine, boy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a box down there. Sorry, sir. Thank you. No, it's not a problem. Thank you. Uh, may I ask now Dr. Bhadman Chandra to propose a formal vote of thanks. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before closing the <coughs> session, it is my pleasant duty to offer you a vote of thanks. <coughs> for your kind participation in the function. First of all, I would like to specially thank Honorable Sri Desi Pank for having spared his time to come and participate in the function. His presence was a great source of inspiration to all of us. My special thanks also go to Ambassador Chadwal for having presided over the proceedings so wonderfully well. Thank you, Madam Sony, for your perseverance, guidance, and commitment. We are thankful to your Commodore Jarjit Singh for being gracious to be with us and deliver a wonderful, thought-provoking address. We are also thankful to Mr. Raj Deval Hans, Director of India Habitat Center, and his entire staff in the program office for their untiring support and help in organizing this ceremony. Finally, my terms of thanks to the distinguished audience who made the ceremony a grand success. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So then, yes, I'm